Hey everyone, welcome to this week's conversation with Dr. Stephen Ned about the body and how to fix, protect, or maintain it using outside-the-box alternative solutions. If you're a big fan of the pharmaceutical or surgical approach, you are so in the wrong place because on this podcast, we're not going to be pushing the conventional medicine methods or way of thinking about health. If you're looking for another way to live longer and healthier, join me, Ron Ned, and my brother, Dr. Stephen Ned, for this week's body chat about shoulder problems. Me? I'm a retired Twin Cities chiropractor currently helping people buy and sell homes in the Tampa Bay and Los Angeles areas. My brother has a thriving chiropractic practice in the Clearwater area of Tampa Bay, Florida. In this podcast, we're going to chat about all sorts of topics related to health, nutrition, exercise, just about everything having to do with the body. You're invited to listen in to our body chat, but don't forget that neither of us is giving you health advice. So don't rush off to do something without either checking with your doctor first or seeing Dr. Steven Nett as a patient at his office. Good evening, Steve. Good evening, Brother Ron. So this time we're going to talk about an issue that both of us have had problems with you more than me, and it has to do with shoulder problems. And so what are the most common shoulder problems that people have to deal with? You see a lot of people that come in your office with shoulder problems. What are the most common problems? Well, yeah, shoulder is definitely one of the most common complaints that I see on a regular basis. And it actually affects up to 20% of the population and Mm -hmm. is more common in middle age and affects women more than men. The most common complaints I see are pain, tightness, weakness, loss of range of motion, tenderness to the touch, burning, and swelling. Okay. And the most common diagnosed conditions are tendinitis, bursitis, rotator cuff disorders, including tears. Mm-hmm. Of course, arthritis and bone spurs, and frozen shoulder, too, as well as what we call subluxations. Okay. And for those of you don't, that don't know what that is, it's a minor misalignment of the joint in which it can slip out of position, and it can cause pain and tightness and loss of motion and so forth. It could also happen anywhere in the body, including the spine. That's what we treat as chiropractors. That's correct. Yeah. And then less common things that we see are fractures, dislocations, and separations. And those we typically will refer out for imaging studies as well as orthopedic consults. Right. Because those are kind of beyond the scope. Yeah. And, you know, these things can occur from an injury, from bad posture, excessive overhead activity, wear and tear, and of course, the aging process, and also poor sports technique, like baseball pitchers and golfers and so forth, that if their technique is off, they can start developing these types of complaints. And pain can be referred to the shoulder from pinched nerves from the neck. And so we always check that, as well as from organs, including the stomach, liver, gallbladder, and heart. Hmm. See that a lot. Yep. Sherlock Holmes said, if you don't look for it, you'll never find it. So I look for that all the time. That's very smart to do. Yeah. Okay. Now, shoulders aren't weight bearing like the knees are. So why is recovering from a shoulder injury sometimes longer and harder than from something like a knee injury or a hip injury? Yes. Well, the unique thing about the shoulder is that it's not only the most mobile joint in the body since the ball and socket like your hip, Mm -hmm. but it's also the most unstable joint. And so, yeah, like the hip, they both are ball and socket, but the hip is more stable since it's weight bearing, but it's less mobile than the shoulder. So the instability of the shoulder dangling downward with nothing to brace it, but ligaments, muscles, and other soft tissue like cartilage make recovery often harder and longer. Hmm. And at first, many major shoulder injuries and especially after surgeries require a sling for support. Then you get into pain reduction procedures and regaining range of motion afterwards. Very good. Yeah, and I've had three arthroscopic shoulder surgeries, so this unfortunately is all too familiar with me. And rehab was not fun, but fortunately, each time I was back to work in less than three weeks, thanks to some of the additional alternative therapies that I incorporated that we'll talk about. Okay, good. Yeah. So when someone has a shoulder injury, what should they do to protect it from further injury? And should they use ice or heat on it? Well, obviously, the first thing is if a body position, motion, or activity aggravates it, then stop doing that, Mm -hmm. okay? Uh, If it hurts too much to move, then the best thing to do is immobilize the arm by using a sling if it's available. And if you don't have a sling, this is kind of cool, 
you can put your arm across your chest and immobilize it with either an ACE bandage or sports tape. Okay. So if you're in a pinch and you don't have a sling, you can do that in the short term. Mm -hmm. So if it's newly injured and it's very tender to touch, if it's swollen or hot and basically inflamed, then ice is the obvious choice. Right. But if it's tight and difficult to move, then use heat to relax the muscles. So that's the big difference. Okay. That's yeah. good to know. Yeah. Now, if the injury is severe enough that you need a sling, the pain is sharp and constant. It doesn't allow you to sleep or you can't sleep on the side of the shoulder. I mean, pretty much any of these means that you need to get it properly diagnosed by a competent health professional immediately. All right. So repeat those again for people. Basically, if you need a sling, it's like a new injury. If the pain is sharp and constant, if it doesn't allow you to sleep at night, for example, you can't sleep on the side of the shoulder that's bothering you, you pretty much want to get that checked out right away. Okay. And the other thing is if you dislocate your shoulder and can't get it to go back in yourself, then it's important to get it x-rayed because there also may be a fracture and trying to reset it without knowing this can cause some serious damage. So in other words, don't do like Bruce Willis did in that movie. What movie was that? Do you remember? No, that was Lethal Weapon 2. That was Mel Gibson. He used to bang oh, okay. the against the... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, they were both out around the same time frame, but yes. You remember that? Yeah. I yeah. Did. So people shouldn't do that. Yeah. I never did that method when I dislocated mine. Yeah. But, that's um, good. Yeah. Pretty much that's worthy of a hospital visit. And, you know, luckily I was able to get it back in place in the 30 plus times that I dislocated mine and never had to go to the hospital for any of these. That's good. Yeah. All right. So then you said if it's got any of those situations going on, they need to get a proper diagnosis. So what kind of tests or imaging should be done to determine what was injured in a shoulder or what kind of injury it is? Well, first of all, there's many orthopedic tests that can be performed by a qualified health professional to get an idea of what was injured in the shoulder. Now, these tests aren't definitive and they can mean many things, plus they can produce some false positive and negative tests. So I don't put a lot of weight into them when it comes to a definitive diagnosis. They're just kind of helpful in getting an idea of what is potentially injured. Mm -hmm. So at that point, x-rays are normally the first imaging test to perform since they can tell you if there's a fracture, a dislocation, a separation, uh, let's, let's say a bone spur, or other bone and joint issues like arthritis. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then since the shoulder is composed of many soft tissues, including muscles, tendons, ligaments, and cartilage, an MRI is the king of imaging since it shows both soft tissue and bony structures looking at it from multiple angles and depths. Okay. Sometimes dye has to be injected into the joint to see the structures better. And mm -hmm. I've had this done before and it's called an MRI arthrogram. Okay. You actually have to go into a, a CT scan and they have to actually see that the fluid is in there and then they put you in the MRI. Ah, yeah. okay. And there's a new technology called musculoskeletal ultrasound. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's the same device that looks at an unborn fetus. But what's cool about this is that you can do a live motion analysis on a joint and see all the structures. Mm, that's great. Yeah. Have you done one of those yet? No, but I've seen it done and it's fascinating. I mean, the ultrasound has progressed to the point now where they can actually see the features on a fetus, like the nose and mm -hmm. the eyes and everything. It's incredible. That's really awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's very interesting. So those are some of the best ways of doing imaging to see what's going on with the shoulder injury. Yes. Okay. Then what is a frozen shoulder? A frozen shoulder is a painful and disabling shoulder condition that's typically slow developing and may or may not occur due to an injury. It's characterized by painful and restricted active and passive shoulder motion. So in other words, it hurts and it's hard to move whether you try to move your shoulder or if somebody else tries to move it for you. Okay. And it's also known as adhesive capsulitis. Mm -hmm. And it's important to define this because, you know, you might go to a doctor and they'll say this and it'll be on your diagnosis. So I want to just simplify it so people understand it better. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so adhesions are bands of scar tissue that develop after an injury or surgery typically. Mm-hmm. And capsulitis is inflammation of the capsule, which is the connective tissue that surrounds a joint. Okay. So adhesive capsulitis of the shoulder specifically is thickening, swelling, and tightening of the capsule around the shoulder joint due to adhesions that have formed inside the capsule. Okay. 
And then the capsule becomes so thick and tight that it's hard to move your arm and shoulder. Mm. Yeah. And there's no specific agreed upon cause of frozen shoulder, but there are a few risk factors that make you more susceptible to it. What are those? First and foremost is diabetes. Hmm. Yeah. 10 to 20% of the people with diabetes get frozen shoulder. Really? Yeah. That's a pretty high percentage. I know. And it's even higher in insulin dependent diabetics at 36%. Hmm. And it's often seen in both shoulders in those types. And the connection to diabetes is unknown at this time. So basically medicine has no idea why it is. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, of course that's, yeah, I can make a comment about medicine not knowing why something is being kind of prevalent, but I won't. Okay. And there's additional medical problems that are associated with frozen shoulder, and they include hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism, hmm. Parkinson's disease, and heart disease. Hmm. Yeah. The other thing that's important is immobilization. So you can get a frozen shoulder after a shoulder has been immobilized for a period of time due to a surgery, a fracture, or another injury. So it's critical that people move and rehab their shoulders soon after an injury or surgery to prevent frozen shoulder from actually occurring. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then what kind of treatments are normally prescribed by medical doctors for the most common shoulder injuries? Well, hands down, most medical doctors prescribe physical therapy for most shoulder conditions, whether it's ultrasound for pain and inflammation, electrical muscle stim, or myofascial release for muscle tension, mm -hmm. or range of motion and exercise therapy to improve movement, flexibility, and strength. Okay. And then medical doctors also often inject shoulders with cortisone to reduce joint inflammation. That's not a good thing to do. Yeah. You know why is because multiple cortisone injections have unique side effects, including thinning of the joint cartilage, mm -hmm. weakening of the ligaments of the joint, increased inflammation in the joint, which is what you're actually trying to handle. Mm -hmm. And that's due to a reaction of an injected substance that ends up crystallized in the joint. Great. Causes this gritty type irritation. Yeah. And the potential introduction of infection into the joint. Right. Yeah. So, you know, one cortisone shot might be okay, but I always try to discourage patients from getting multiple because I've seen these types of side effects. Okay. Yeah. And then medical doctors will also often prescribe over-the-counter NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin, Tylenol, and ibuprofen to reduce pain and inflammation or prescribe even a stronger medication if this doesn't work. And obviously, if it's a serious condition like a broken bone or a tear in a muscle, ligament or cartilage, then surgery, preferably arthroscopic, may be the only option, unfortunately. So what is arthroscopic? That means using a scope so that you can go in and they can go in and look. It's like a magnifying glass and they can see up close and not have to go in and do what's called an open procedure where they slice the whole thing open and they have to put a huge amount of stitches and then you're wearing a sling for a long time. And so I've opted not to have an open procedure. I've had three arthroscopic procedures on my shoulder. So that's where they make a very small incision and they do everything through that incision. So there's not a big open scar or wound. Well, actually there's two incisions. There's one for where they go in with the instrument that they're using to repair and then another one to put the uh, camera in. Okay. But yeah. still there's no big incisions. No. Okay. Yeah. And then for frozen shoulder, another option is hydrodilatation. And this is something I found out this week in researching this. So if your symptoms are not relieved by other non-surgical methods that we just talked about, mm -hmm. your doctor may recommend this procedure, which involves gently injecting a large volume of sterile fluid, like saline, into the shoulder joint to expand and stretch the shoulder joint capsule. And it's conducted by a radiologist who uses imaging such as a CT scan or ultrasound to guide the placement of the fluid. Hmm. Yeah. So that, that seems like it's okay to try. Yeah. If nothing else is working. Yeah. Another thing that they've done is manipulation under anesthesia, which I do not recommend at all. It's very expensive and risky. I mean, it's risky and who knows how much they're moving your arm around. You're under the influence. When you wake up, it's probably going to be very, very sore. I mean, that cost over $20,000 just for somebody to take your arm and move it around a little bit. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I just don't agree with that. Okay. Yeah. I don't either. Yeah. 
So then what alternative treatments have you found to be successful for shoulder injuries or chronic shoulder conditions? Well, obviously, first off, chiropractic. Mm -hmm. So your shoulder is the most mobile and unstable joint and can misalign quite easily. So shoulder adjustments are incredibly helpful and effective. And in addition, the muscles and all the structures of the shoulder depend on uninterrupted nerve flow from the neck. So I always check the neck for misalignments and adjust these to restore nerve power and communication too. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the cold laser. Cold laser therapy is outstanding for shoulder conditions for two reasons. Why is that? Well, one, there are often weak muscles that stabilize and move the shoulder, and the cold laser that I use has a quick 30-second protocol that strengthens weak muscles. Okay. Yeah. And then as far as pain and inflammation, the cold laser is excellent at reducing this too. All right. So you've got two different angles to get, come from with the cold laser. Yeah. And I can even throw in a third. I just What's thought of that. It. It's also incredible for healing injuries rapidly and reducing scar tissue, especially after surgeries. That's true. Cause you talked about that on the last episode. Yeah. So there we are. So adding to the list is dry needling and acupuncture. Mm -hmm. They're excellent for all types of shoulder complaints to reduce pain and inflammation. And of course they stimulate the natural painkillers called endorphins and restore balance to the area. True. Yeah. And there's also lots of excellent natural painkillers and anti-inflammatory supplements that can be taken in pill form or as a topical spray. Mm -hmm. And I particularly love the spray called Cryoderm, which is very similar to Biofreeze, since it's a non-drug formula that really works well and quickly. I mean, it has eucalyptus, menthol, peppermint, arnica, MSM, no alcohol, no additives, preservatives. It's really good stuff. Excellent. And they can get that through you. Yes. Okay. And obviously, if it's a serious condition and not responding, I will not hesitate to order an x-ray or an MRI. Mm -hmm. And I have some excellent sports orthopedists who are not knife happy that I refer to when a shoulder condition might require a surgical intervention. Okay. Yeah. What about prolotherapy? Yeah, that's another thing that's helpful. And you can talk about your experience if you like. Well, didn't you have some prolotherapy? I did. And actually, I didn't get the result that I was looking for. I actually got a better result from PRP, platelet-rich plasma, right? From my own blood. But in my case, the prolotherapy just kind of irritated it more, and it didn't really turn on the, the healing and the anti-inflammatory effect. It actually created more inflammation. And that can happen in some people. Now, what is it that they inject in prolotherapy? Normally, it's salt water, saline. Okay, so that's injected right into the ligament or the joint. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to just cause a healing activity to occur, correct? Yeah, it causes a mild inflammatory response or inflammation. And then your body's immune system is supposed to kick in and repair the area more efficiently. Okay, so that's how prolotherapy works. Mm -hmm. And how does PRP work? Well, PRP means platelet-rich plasma, where they take a sample of your blood, they spin it down in a centrifuge, which concentrates your platelets, which have all kinds of growth factors in them to heal and regenerate tissue. Mm -hmm. And so I did that with my shoulder before and after one of my surgeries, and it definitely helped. It sped up the healing process so that I can get back to work faster. All right. So they do that, then they get the platelets and they inject those into the joint and that's what helps speed up the healing process. Yes. Okay. So those are two alternatives to any kind of a surgery. They're an injection, but it's not a drug and it's not surgical. So that would be something that you don't necessarily do, but it's something that a person could do that would be an alternative. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, stem cells has become popular recently too. And that's another alternative. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Now that's for a regular type of shoulder situations. And you went over one type of treatment for frozen shoulder, but what is the best way to handle a frozen shoulder? Typically treatment is structured to reduce pain and improve range of motion. So that might include chiropractic adjustments, uh, cold laser therapy, muscle and fascia release using mm -hmm. the deep massager called the percussor, mm -hmm. dry needling and acupuncture, and various home stretching and mobility exercises. 
like the wall walking exercise or wall crawling exercise? Yeah, that's actually part of Codman's pendular exercises, walking your fingers up the wall, as well as if you take a can of vegetables or soup and you let your arm dangle downward and then do like 10 circles clockwise and 10 circles counterclockwise, that's another thing that you can do to restore motion. Interesting. Yeah, and then you can take a golf club or a broom and also swing that sideways, and that works on a different range of motion too. Golf club or broom and swing it sideways. What do you mean by sideways? Well, have I mean, have it in front of you so it's going left to right. Okay. Like, like you're swinging a golf club, but you're swinging it forwards and backwards. Okay. So in addition, I, I often have them get checked out by Steve Lund, who is a licensed massage therapist who shares the office with me. He also happens to be a chiropractor. And he has extensive training in releasing tight joint capsules, which obviously includes the shoulder. Hmm. You know, we should have him on our podcast sometime as a guest. Yeah, we'll have to find something to talk about other than Wisconsin cheese and dairy and Green Bay Packers. Packers, Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yes, no. But Steve, I've known Steve for many, many years. Uh, back when he was a chiropractor in Wisconsin and I was a chiropractor in Minnesota. And he's a very good guy, very knowledgeable, very talented. So yes, we'll have to do that. No doubt. All right. So then what are the best exercises for somebody who doesn't have a shoulder condition so that they keep their shoulders moving well and also protect against minor injuries? Well, stretching is at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. And whether you do it through yoga, Pilates, a personal trainer, a physical therapist, or just finding videos on YouTube, you should work shoulder stretches into your daily schedule. Okay. And my personal favorite is using bands and specifically the posture medic. Right. And the reason for that is it includes three easy stretches that work on the shoulder and chest muscles in the front of the body that we overuse. Mm Mm-hmm. And three strengthening exercises to work the shoulder and shoulder blade muscles that we normally underuse. Mm -hmm. And then you wear this device to stabilize your shoulders for a much better posture. Okay. You said stretching exercises is number one. What about exercises that involve weights to build up muscles around the shoulder? Well, again, I would recommend that you do that with preferably a personal trainer so they can tailor the program for you. I mean, based on your height, your weight, your age, people can tend to be too aggressive on that and they can hurt themselves. I'd prefer that you use a professional to tailor it to your needs. Okay, good. Now, is there anything else you'd like to say about this topic before we end? Yeah. I mean, I've become an expert on handling shoulder conditions, not only through my professional training, which includes a diplomate in sports medicine, Mm -hmm. but also unfortunately through my personal experiences of sports injuries and multiple surgeries. So when a patient comes in and is experiencing shoulder pain, I can honestly say to them, I completely understand. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Been there, done that, you know? (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. The traditional and alternative approaches that I've experienced have allowed me to continue to practice and exercise with very little downtime, and I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, that's true, because with what you do every day, if you had problems with your shoulder, you wouldn't be able to continue doing it. That's exactly right. And, you know, drawing from these experiences has allowed me to help tons of patients in multiple ways that I may not have even dreamed of considering. And so I guess that goes along with the old saying, everything happens for a reason. That's true. How long has it been since you had your first shoulder surgery? First one was in 1999. All right. So that's 19 years ago and you've been practicing ever since every day. Yeah. And then I had two in 2012. Ah, Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But you've kept going and it seems like you're not having too much problem with it, really. No. That's great. All right, good. Well, thanks for the information on that, Steve. For people who have shoulder problems or have had shoulder problems, I'm sure it'll be helpful to them. And next week, we're going to go into a different kind of topic, and that has to do with vision. Now, most people would think that that's going to be something an optometrist or ophthalmologist that they would deal with it, but we're going to deal with it more in a natural way as far as nutritionally and exercise, believe it or not, different things for vision and dealing with other types of eye problems that can come about to try and prevent them or what to do to treat them. So next week, 
we'll see what we're going to be talking about. Okay, cool. Looking forward to it. Yeah, <laughs> that was good. <laughs> you got that in there. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Steve. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us this week on the Body Chat Podcast. We both really appreciate your time and your attention. We want to provide you with interesting and informative episodes each week. And if you have a topic you'd like us to cover or any questions you'd like us to answer, send an email to us at info at bodychatpodcast.com. That's info at bodychatpodcast.com. To make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes, subscribe to the Body Chat Podcast now on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or Spotify. See you next week. Bye.